Creflo Dollar wanting a private jet is not remotely unusual. There is a pattern of preachers wanting high-end airplanes, and when they get them, they're not always particularly humble about it. When you give somebody so much power, they become God to people. How much money did you pay for Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, for example? Well, for example, that's really none of your business, but... Isn't it the business of your donors? When I was a kid, I was told to follow religious teachings. Growing up, I was fascinated by countless stories and testimonies by all the believers around me. The term megachurch and televangelist were completely alien to me. I didn't know what those words meant, what they were used for, what they implied. But in this fast-paced world we live in, terms like these aren't exactly that easy to miss. I happened to come across a number of lectures and practices done by these megachurches. I wanted to understand what was going on, how they got to where they are currently and what keeps them going. Countless interviews, documentaries and books were available online and as I dug deeper, a couple of names kept popping up again and again and again. Kenneth Copeland, Fanny Hinn, Chelsea Duplantis, Joy Lausanne. These men are the leaders of some of the biggest megachurches in our lifetime. A Louisiana televangelist is asking his followers for donations to buy a $54 million private jet. Jesse Duplantis runs a church outside New Orleans and also reaches out, that also reaches out worldwide. As I fell into the rabbit hole, I noticed a bunch of similarities on how these men lived. They wore expensive looking suits that looked like they were just made for them, went around different places in their private jets, watches they carry around like badges as if to remind everyone where they are seated in the hierarchy of social classes. Kenneth Copeland alone is worth over 760 million US dollars. And I'm not gonna lie, that amount is no joke. I figured, is this how church leaders are supposed to present themselves? When I think of spirituality and going to churches, I never expected it to be grand and loud and obnoxious and expensive, overwhelming, intimidating, and unwelcoming. In a mega church, masses look like concerts. Preachers enter the stage with a roaring crowd as if it was a fan meeting instead of a church gathering. People are all up on their seats, swaying along to the beat played by the band. Laughter, rain, dancing. Things I never thought would be used to describe what it feels like to go to the church. You look around and you would get the vibe that everyone is there for one thing, devotion. They attend these gatherings to make sure their connection with God never falters. They believe that these so-called messengers of God in front of them would direct them to walk the paths of God and would bring them the salvation they are looking for. These things combined are what makes a mega church a mega church. That and a little bit of miracles. A quick Google search of the term mega church says that a mega church is a church with an unusually large congregation with a membership of about 2,000 members. 2,000 members is a lot, enough to fill a dome with lots and lots of people showed up to witness a miracle. That taught not to fall into temptations and foolishness as these may lead to a life full of destruction. And as I went back to these mega churches, with all their studio-like halls, lectures about living a lavish lifestyle, I thought, is this really what people think it is? Or are they just a disgusting business behind their so-called faith? If God wants us to free ourselves from greed and envy, then why are these so-called preachers living a life of fame, riches, and all that? Shouldn't they be practicing what they're preaching? Are you saying that Jewish people appreciate money more than... They believe in wealth. Some people would find that offensive. To give you a sense of what exactly it is that doesn't sit right with me, think of this. Kenneth Copeland. The founder of Kenneth Copeland Ministries owns a $7 million home in the United States. He has jets he uses for private schedules and owns international churches with more than a thousand members each. Jesse Duplantis, Copeland's colleague, sat beside him in one of his interviews and gave an explanation as to why they need all these lavish things. Duplantis even gave in detail when and why he purchased his not so little toys. Televangelist Jesse Duplantis is hoping to take the word of Jesus to new heights with help from a $54 million private jet. Benny Hinn, the one who claims he can perform miracles, has been broadcasting his sermons online 
which now earns money through streaming. Creflo Dollar used his church to set up fundraising to buy himself jets that he claims he needed to spread the message of God, and people actually donated. He deems himself proud of all this, even goes to the extent of bragging about how he acquired all this. We're going to give it to them if they're a valid request. Uh, one of the issues we're dealing with is, you know, the IRS has already been given the responsibility. Joel Osteen of Houston, Texas has established a mega church of his own. He has now written a book, Your Best Life Now. It is now New York Times bestseller. Osteen has been representing his church through interviews and guestings here and there, living life like an influencer on the go. If you review all these closely, like me, you would know that something just isn't right, just does not sit with me at all. How do these preachers make their followers believe in them? Thousands of followers have devoted their time, effort, money, and even themselves to these individuals and you're telling me not one of them thought all of this is a big lie. What makes them turn a blind eye to all this? Not only they're just okay with the practice but they also do as much as offer their time, money and deem themselves helpful to the church when in fact you can clearly see where all these donations are going to. I just find it a bit sad to think about how these individuals or so-called messengers of God are taking advantage of their vulnerability and faith. These mega churches all have one thing in common, living in prosperity. The world of faith movement or the prosperity gospel has one simple idea. God wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to live a life for prosperity where if a problem occurs, a solution can easily be brought up without anyone suffering. In prosperity gospel, they refer to followers as little gods. They have in them divinity that allows them to bring into existence the prosperity that has been promised by God himself. I quote, And your DNA and Jesus' DNA are exact. Amen. You're exact. Of course, it's going to sound amazing to you, thinking of yourself as someone like God, like the Savior, like someone holy. So you might think, how do I actually acquire my license to live as a little God and bring out the prosperity in me that he promised? According to these preachers, it all starts with faith. Having faith in teachings of the church. Having faith in yourself. And after faith comes tithing. Tithing is when you give a portion of your wealth to your religious organization. Most religious organizations rely on offerings and donations to the church in order to survive and keep operating, especially with these mega churches. But instead of it being like a form of donation, I think in prosperity gospel has a twist to it. It comes to a point where the money you donate to church, instead of it being a donation to help the church prosper, they donate money in hopes of acquiring a bigger amount in return, in exchange for what they initially donated. Isn't that gambling in itself? Prosperity preachers often refer to this as sowing your seed, basically like reaping what you sow. It's the process of giving the church your money and in return you are going to get paid twice the amount in any shape or form. You can't expect a harvest if you don't sow seed. It all seems like it's not real, right? Like no one's going to follow this given how hard it is to earn a living these days. But the thing is, this whole practice generates thousands and thousands of dollars and when you have members who live by this virtue, it's going to generate a big income. You might think, has anyone ever questioned this practice? In 2008, Copeland got a jet which was funded by the donors of his church. They even wrote an article thanking the members for their harvest. But instead of it ending there, the article leads them to even more of these projects and encourages the members to keep donating so as to keep the church harvesting. The next project needed $17 million to complete. Reflo Dollar once had this infamous sermon where he was telling everyone to donate to the church just for himself to buy a jet. And instead of questions raising and curiosity building, what he got in return were cheers and screams from each and every individual in the crowd listening to him. I'm actually at a loss of words at this time. See God as long as I want to. If I want to believe God for a 65 million dollar plane, you cannot stop me. Instead of receiving a backlash for this practice, these people get celebrated for it. Because they use the name of God, the blind believers would just go with the flow. 
even go to the extent of thanking them for all they have done for the church and its members. Prosperity believers would simply put it off, thinking it's just the right way to spread the message and become true servants of the church and of God. And in that way, they will acquire the prosperity they were destined for in this lifetime. The cars, the private jets, the high-end shoes, these aren't seen as fruits of the laborers' businessmen. These are seen as proof of their harvest and faith by their followers. Living a lavish lifestyle is seen as practicing what they preach, living in prosperity, living an abundant life, the extravagant life, the life we all dreamt of having. These preachers would often say that the donations they receive are used for improvement of the church and the church alone. But in a religious organization, how does money and income actually generate? The prosperity gospel is not far from the entire law of attraction theory. Like all things, it all just boils down to setting your thoughts into positivity and success. There aren't proofs available that these things really do happen. Maybe just a mere coincidence and a sheer streak of good luck. One of the reasons why these preachers are so believable, in my opinion, is because they deem themselves trustworthy and talk more like how a self-help speaker would present themselves. We would naturally rely on them for some sort of guidance in all this uncertainty in the world. Even though it doesn't guarantee you success, seeing someone with a higher success rate is enough for us to put our faith in the practice and ourselves as well and wait for the good outcome to finally reach us. They use God as a proxy for all their lessons. In that way, it's going to make them a whole lot more credible and believable. Like self-help books and lectures, it's all in the mind. Joel Osteen's New York Times best-selling book about the church is made up of quotes that help you understand the importance of putting faith and in some way, it's just like any other self-help book in your local bookstore. But the thing that makes people hooked on to the prosperity gospel is the sowing the seed part. Of course, it's gonna sound amazing, especially if you want bigger things in life. A new car, a bigger house, a new watch, a new suit. You can acquire all of this by simply donating. You'll get everything you've been wanting in return. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't hold on to a possibility like that? That chance, that opportunity. This practice is now being spread even further. It has taken over Europe and now Africa. David Odipo is one of the wealthiest pastors in Nigeria. His net worth is currently 115 million US dollars. To quote him, we are not asking you to give so the church can be blessed. We are asking you to give so that you can be blessed. He says in one of his lectures, these preachers, as I was observing them, can act as if all this is beneficial for everyone and they are here to help those in need. It could be an act pulled perfectly. Benny Hinn is known for his miracles. He's known for being able to perform miracles on his sermons in front of thousands of members. He would bring people with illnesses on stage with him and a single touch from him would transfer God's energy and presence onto them. The force would make them fall back and catchers would be there to catch them once they do. People in the audience would cheer and put their hands up in the air as if worshipping the Lord as they witnessed yet another miracle right in front of their eyes. And the thing is, Benny Hinn isn't the only one who does this. This is a common practice among pastors of the prosperity gospel. Like I said, is any of this real? One of their ex-members, Benny's nephew, once said in an interview that to live the prosperity gospel is to look really good, look really blessed, sell the narrative, make all the money and say, look at my life. If you give to this, if you follow it and if you do what I say, God will do it for you too. He left the church after realizing that way of life isn't for him. Living in a mansion guarded by top-notch security, driving around in the most expensive cars, vacationing on the most beautiful islands in the most expensive outfit. This was his life when he was living in prosperity and through this he truly believed that what he was doing was something to really believe in. His life was a living proof of the gospel. He was made to believe he was sowing the seed his family planted. As I dug deeper into this rabbit hole, I came across some stories that made me question these practices even more. Grace Burlode's mother brought her to one of the Hinn's crusades where he performs these miracles and 
just as she was about to be brought up, she was faced with screeners who told her to step aside. Apparently, the job of these screeners were basically to weed out those who were severely sick. Grace was nowhere near getting better. It's the same fate that will take Janice Brillat and her eight-year-old daughter Grace to see Benny Hinn in Calgary. Grace was born with a debilitating variation of muscular dystrophy. If Jesus healed 2,000 years ago, then if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, believing that verse in the Bible, then um, I believe that he can still do it today for grace. So with her child in her arms, Janice edged her way down and through the crowd towards the stage. Like many others, it wasn't long before they were intercepted by ministry screeners and told to sit down. Grace and I moved over to the side. We sat and waited and Grace asked me. Justin Peters, born with cerebral palsy, was also stopped by the screeners when they went to one of the crusades. He went there with hopes of becoming better, of acquiring the prosperity that was meant for him. Justin left empty-handed. HBO was once given full access to one of Hinn's crusades. They were given the chance to follow healings of the members blessed by Hinn himself. In the documentary, one of the boys brought to him. After the healing, he still hasn't recovered from his illness. The mother states that even though her child wasn't healed, her faith still remains untouchable. This is all part of God's plan. After the gathering, the father supposedly had a talk with God and in that conversation, he was asked to donate 2,000 US dollars, which he did, no questions asked. We're expecting a miracle. Mm, yeah. The Prakash family are recent immigrants to America. Ten-year-old Ash Neil is their younger son. Two massive brain tumors have reduced him to a vegetative state. You know, I can stake my life on Pastor Benny Hinn's words. And God spoke to me last night at the at the Colosseum Center where the crusade was going on and he said donate him another two thousand dollars and which I'm going to do it I'm going to do that what are we witnessing actually when we see performances like this what is actually happening and more importantly why do people believe in all of this if this is reality then why do these people perform their miracles on stages instead of going around to hospitals and just help the doctors treat people? Why do they need an audience? Why do they need to give a good performance? Why do they need to act and live like a high-profile celebrity behind the scenes? Then it hit me. It's all in the mind. Psychology. The power of suggestion. Misdirection. This is all that's happening in there playing tricks with the human mind, making them feel like they need you and that you are someone they should believe in because you are this and you are that. It's all mind games and it's something that's really hard to get out of, especially to blind believers. Tricking people into believing it's working is a big, big part of this so-called faith healing. Instead of evidences as answers, what we get in return are meaningless words and phrases that we hold on to without any assurance that it will eventually happen. The power performed by these preachers is mainly rooted in the entire setting of the gathering. A little hard to understand? Let me break it down for you. In a hall where people gather to hear gospel, spotlights, microphones, music are made available which can contribute to how you feel initially. There is a sense of unity which can be mistaken for something else. The pastor comes in and the reaction from everyone is enough to make your body feel chills because a lot of people are agreeing to what the pastor is saying. Our minds will eventually start believing in every word he says. It's as if being surrounded by believers could encourage you to shift your focus and believe in what he's been telling you. When performing these miracles, little do we know, it's just human emotions he's tying with, exerting force here and there just to make it seem like something is happening before your very eyes. All the tricks are mind games we could definitely pass on the untrained eye. Like a conductor of an orchestra, the preacher would then bring everyone to join in as the grand finale comes closer. This way, he has you wrapped up in the palm of his hands and could easily suggest anything including how you should feel and how or what you should believe in. Being in these gatherings could also feel like you're in a hypnotic, trance-like state with beautiful, flowery words presented before you paired with heightened emotions. You would feel as if it was really God himself who's standing right before you. Social conformity is when an individual alters the behavior or beliefs in order to fit in the group. 
this is no different from what hypnosis does to people. In this heightened state, it is more likely to feel the things we have been wanting to feel because our minds are all about wanting this to happen, wanting to feel it, to experience it. In other words, it is the placebo effect. It circles around expectations. Our minds believe something is bound to happen once we are expecting something to happen. Our senses become heightened. Even just the smallest possible thing we can relate to what it is we are expecting to happen becomes enough of a proof and an answer just to satisfy whatever it is we are holding on to. In this case, their faith. Their faith in living prosperity of getting a lot in return for their good deeds, for their investment, for their donation. This is why no faith healer can perform miracles that go beyond the limitations of human beings. People are often satisfied just with the tiniest bit of proof presented to them because people want to believe it's true because of all the flowery words said to them, because of who is presenting these ideations to them, because they use the name of God, because they target our minds, our faith, our emotions. Believers who have not been healed would then start to blame themselves, thinking they weren't devoted enough or that they haven't given enough donation to this church, that's why it didn't work. Deception, trickery, hoax. You look around and see the faces of people who badly want to heal from whatever it is that is bringing them pain. Look at them and see how much they are hanging on to that little bit of hope in front of them, giving them everything they have got left to give, giving them a part of themselves they can never get back again. Amidst all this you'd think, will they ever get justice they deserve? Will they ever come to their senses and see how badly they are being tricked? Is there a way to stop this? Is there a way to help? Recently, Benihin changed his way of spreading the gospel and of giving his sermon. He says he is no longer accustomed to the entire living in prosperity thing. But because of the community he's built, it is very hard for him to stay away from the culture he's created. John Piper Founder of the Trinity Foundation has been doing some work on exposing the wrong practices of these mega churches. But because of how established and loved they are already, it's hard to even shake their faith in the church. Because at the end of the day, having faith in something isn't and will never be wrong. It's the people we put our faith into that can do us harm. Most of these mega churches still operate up to this day, and there'll still be a generation who'll keep the practice long after they're gone. Deception is really hard to stop, especially when there are more than thousands of people who back them up. The only thing we can do is to help not spread it any further and make them see what we are seeing from outside the box. But until then, this church is obviously more of a business that will still continue to flourish and use their believers. And we'll all be out here wondering when they will come to their senses. Faith is hope. It is something we have to use with a clear mind pure heart, good intention. It should not be used to gain wealth, to gain followers, to live in mansions. I made this video so that this can reach to as many people as it can who follow and worship these mega churches. My name is Nick and if you enjoyed this video, I'll see you guys in the next documentary. Till then, take care and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel.